Uh, I see many familiar faces, um, but if you don't know who I am, I'm Hendrik Spry, director of the Buffett Center, and welcome um, to this uh, meeting today, and also hope to see you next door in the Buffett Center itself, on other occasions, of course. Um, uh, just a few quick uh, remarks before we begin, before I introduce the speaker, uh, Professor Ramadan, today. Uh, first of all, apologies. We don't normally schedule things off cycle, which is usually the academic year. Uh, many of the students, except the hardcore, uh, many of the students are uh, still um, enjoying the last days of freedom before we clamp down. Um, I should also say that some of our faculty on the Middle East North Africa group uh, is actually in Qatar right now uh, for a workshop, so we're a little bit shorthanded on the faculty side as well, uh, and that has something to do again with the off-cycle uh, system. Um, but of course this was a golden opportunity to have Professor Ramadan back at Northwest and so we had to avail ourselves of this golden opportunity and we're very happy to have him here with us. Um, can, can you all hear me, by the way? Um, so I'm being mic'd in, but I don't know if the mic translates to you. I'll, I'll try to speak up. Um, just a few quick words also about procedure. Each of the panelists, uh, myself, Bob Rowley, Director of Media Relations, uh, to the right of Professor Ramadan, John Caverly, my colleague in political science, and to his left and your right, um, Professor Rachel Riedel, also from political science. Each of the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes. We'll try to focus on some key themes and questions that we thought might be useful to steer the discussion. Then we'll steer uh, ourselves towards Professor Ramadan, who will talk about his latest book, Islam and the Arab Awakening. Um, as I'll mention in a few minutes, he's an extremely prolific author, and he writes so fast that the press <laughs> actually couldn't keep up. Uh, so the book at the back is not his latest offering, but he's uh, certainly willing to uh, sign the book that is available through Oxford University Press. But this is the latest book coming out on Islam and the Arab Awakening, and that is the book that we'll discuss today. Um, of course, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know um, who we're dealing with, but let me just say a few words about Professor Ramadan. Um, it is a distinct pleasure, of course, to have him back. He was here two years ago. Uh, that talk, by the way, is on our website and is available. We taped that as well. It was also one of the talks that had um, a very large number of hits, so a continued interest, not just in the Northwestern community, but also beyond that. Um, so um, I, I'm doubly happy to welcome him because I was in Canada at the time he was talking here, so I missed him at that juncture. I'm glad to hear him today. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ramadan received his training, as you know, at the University of Geneva, uh, where he wrote two theses. He was already prolific. As a student, uh, he wrote on Nietzsche, but also, of course, on Islam. So there were two, two theses for his PhD, actually. He's currently Al Thani Professor of Contemporary Islamic Studies at Oxford University. Um, to say that he's prolific is an understatement. I did a quick survey of, of books in uh, multiple languages uh, and I counted at least 20, and I think the count might be 21, 22, um, probably working on another one as we speak, uh, but extremely prolific uh, and translated, of course, in many languages. Uh, a few titles in English, um, The Quest for Meaning, Developing a Philosophy of Pluralism, I think a telling title about uh, his work and what he stands for, uh, which came out in 2010. Uh, what I Believe, with Oxford University Press in 2009. Um, Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation, also by Oxford, November 2008. I wish I could write a book a year. I'm slightly behind um, by about 17 or 18 books, I'm afraid. Uh, Lessons from the Life of Muhammad, um, also by Oxford, 2007. Islam, the West and Challenges of Modernity. Uh, and many more books um, in English and French, and, and many of these, as I already said, translated in multiple languages. So an extremely uh, prolific and acclaimed scholar. Uh, of course, he's a very well-known public intellectual as well. Uh, he's been a political consultant in various organizations and countries. Um, I was intrigued by a Guardian interview that I dug up, uh, which listed him as also a semi-professional uh, football player at one point and ski instructor. Uh, so a man of, of many talents and dimensions. Um, of course, it's also fair to say that he's been a controversial figure. Uh, as you know, he was denied a visa in the post 9-11 aftermath. Um, he then subsequently was asked to reapply during the Obama administration, of course, uh, then getting a visa at that time. Um, earlier, in 1995, I believe, he was refused entry to France. He's also been a controversial figure in the Netherlands, partially through his uh, uh, role as a consultant on integration to the municipal government of Rotterdam. 
Um, so somebody who's been in the midst of, of, of a firestorm in some cases, uh, but it's also telling and noteworthy that he's also been banned in Tunisia, uh, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia. So again, showing you the complexities of trying to straddle uh, both worlds. Um, a complex man, to say the least, but also uh, one who, in my view, embodies uh, the very research topic that he, that he, he studies. That is to say, um, he's looking at the interface of the West, however you construe the concept, um, and we'll have to talk about that concept itself, and the Muslim world. Um, and he looks at that interface between these two. Uh, and indeed, in this Guardian interview that I just mentioned, he described himself as follows. Um, quote, uh, I have multiple identities. I am Swiss by nationality, Muslim by religion, Egyptian by memory. Unquote. Um, so somebody who tries to reach out in the various um, uh, dimensions, as I already mentioned. Um, but we're here today to talk about his book. So I want to make a few points here. Um, I, I certainly encourage you to um, get the book, read through it. It's an extremely rich oeuvre to look at uh, of a, a critically important topic today. Um, each book, of course, can be read myriads of ways. Each reader takes his or her own interest to the book. Um, so I'm just going to make a few suggestions of some of the key themes that I think emerge out of this book. Um, the first theme, key theme that I read, uh, is an attempt to overcome this false binary opposition between the West, the West, and the Muslim world, right? This categorization and this false binary opposition of the two. Um, and I think that what uh, Professor Ramadan does in the book is to suggest that initially we read the Muslim world as the other, the hostile other, right? The, uh, and let's be frank, the inferior other in the West's reading. Um, not democratic, not authoritarian, not rational, um, not subject to self-experimentation and self-criticism. Following the Arab Spring, we've engaged in another false uh, categorization, which is to suggest that this will be the West redux, if you will. That is to say, they're catching up they're engaging in Western universals of rationality, self-criticism, and it is simply a question of them um, adopting the Western model, if you will. There's an assumption that the Western model is a universal standard uh, to which the Muslim world must aspire. Uh, and he says this is a false binary opposition. You're not going to see this. Um, I think he's also saying more than uh, that the West has misconstrued the Muslim world. Uh, by superimposing these Western concepts of rationality, criticism, self-examination. Even many Muslims, um, including a profound critic of, of Western Orientalism as Edward Said, uh, Professor Ramadan argues, uh, even people like Edward Said, Said accept this imposition, accept this notion that um, rationality, criticism, self-evaluation are Western universals that should be applied to the Muslim world. So, uh, if you will, um, the subject category has, has accepted this, this mode of, of domination itself. Um, that is to say, um, Muslims themselves might believe that they are to become like the West. And that, um, as he points out, is a misconception. And to his left and your right, um, Professor Rachel Riedel, also from political science, each of the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes. We'll try to focus on some key themes and questions that we thought might be useful to see the discussion. Then we'll steer uh, ourselves towards Professor Ramadan, who will talk about his latest book, Islam and the Arab Awakening. Um, as I'll mention in a few minutes, he's an extremely prolific author, and he writes so fast that the press <laughs> actually couldn't keep up. Uh, so the book at the back is not his latest offering, but he's uh, certainly willing to uh, sign the book that is available through Oxford University Press. But this is the latest book coming out on Islam and the Arab Awakening, and that is the book that we'll discuss today. Um, both in the West as well as in the Muslim world itself. Rational introspection, political ascent, self-examination, uh, in fact, are not foreign to the foreign world, uh, to the Muslim world. Uh, and he notes several dissonant scholars in the past, uh, in the historical past, who have uh, examined um, the Muslim world quite critically from the inside out. Um, but, but self-examination, rational uh, calculation, dissident, uh, movements will take on a unique flavor, not a Western model. So we're going to see a hybrid, if you will, and, and a recomposition of new and yet unexplored uh, models in, in, in this area of the world, rather than simply the uh, minus adult adoption of, of Western models. Um, a second main theme that I think comes out of the book 
uh, a, a very interesting discussion of how the secular and the religious interrelate. Um, first, on this point, uh, the separation is artificial. That even in the West, religion and the secular are, in fact, intertwined. Uh, in fact, one of my colleagues, Beth Hurd, has written about this issue, uh, and I think this ties nicely to what Professor Ramadan talks about. Um, at the same time, the separation of the secular and religious uh, worked out in distinct ways. That in the West, the separation, in fact, allowed for the proliferation of religious movements. That to say that religion, by pushing it, if you will, into the private sphere, was not seen to be antithetical to political movements. That the state and religion were not necessarily at opposites. Whereas in the Muslim world, uh, authoritarian regimes, in particular uh, regimes that attempted to modernize in the Western model, saw religion as retrograde, as opposite, and something that needed to be repressed. And in so doing, the religious movements automatically became perceived by these regimes as movements of opposition, dissent, that is to say, movements that needed to be repressed at all costs. So in that sense, the separation of secular and religious worked out quite differently in the Muslim world <laughs> than in the Western world. Instead, the book suggests, um, and I think Professor Ramadan would suggest, that this polarization of state, Islam, democracy uh, is, in fact, um, incorrect. And, in fact, they can be reconciled. How they are to be reconciled, of course, is the question that is still up on the, the table. Uh, but they are not, in fact, necessary opposites. Many more themes, I think, are uh, permeating through the book. Um, but I think those were two themes I would like to highlight. And I'd like to follow with four questions, um, if I get to that, uh, three to four questions. And perhaps those will steer some of our discussions. Um, first question to uh, Professor Ramadan. Um, the book ends with an acknowledgment and, in fact, a religious invocation. All right. um, it seems to me that, in so doing, he accepts that religion has returned as a political force in politics. And I would argue that it has, not just in the Muslim world, but arguably also in the West, and particularly in the United States. Um, so if, if that is one of the premises that religion is a, a returning political force, if you will, uh, it sparks the following question. Insofar religion is perceived as the pursuit of ultimate ends, <coughs> does its resurgence of religion make mutual understanding more problematic, more difficult in both the West and the Muslim world? That is to say, the resurgence of, of religion, not just in the Muslim world, but also particularly in the United States, uh, making these compromises if you will, or mutual understandings more difficult than they have been in the past. Second question related to my previous point about the resurgence of religion. Um, you mentioned in the book that much of the uprisings initially were uh, led by uh, young activists who worked outside of the religious hierarchy, that these were not necessarily sanctioned. In fact, sometimes the religious hierarchy would come out against the dissent, believing that uh, a role of uh, background activism was perhaps more uh, uh, efficient. Um, so if in the initial phase the, um, the activists were working outside the religious hierarchy, subsequently what we seem to have encountered is a reassertion of this religious hierarchy. That uh, we've seen um, religious movements, both you know, Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, Salafist movements, etc., uh, establish themselves um, within these activist movements. So this leads to my second question then. Does this reassertion of hierarchy problematize the continuation of what was initially a broad-based movement uh, that was driven by a very broad constituency with many diverse agendas and objectives? In other words, what are the implications of this reassertion of hierarchy and religion? And perhaps this goes into some of the institutional issues that my colleagues John Cable and Rachel Riedel will talk about, uh, that is say the institutionalization of the social movement, uh, particularly institutionalization by religious groups, um, what, what are the implications of that? Um, third observation. Um, the situation, of course, is changing by the minute. In fact, you've seen all the events of the last 24 hours. Um, it's also the first book that I've seen that has not one or two appendixes. It has 26 um, with the uh, discussion of, of events as they unfold. Um, so it is a very fluid uh, development. Um, and... Um, and the book points out um, in the discussion, but also in the appendices, how many contentious issues are still on the table. And at one point, uh, he notes seven. Um, I'll just give you a few here. Uh, but these seem to be quite dramatic uh, issues that need to be resolved. Um, among these contentious issues, um, first one, 
Um, how do we define who is the count of the Muslim? All right. Not that straightforward. What is a true religious Muslim? Uh, second one, um, discussions and differences about the use of violence. When is violence legitimate and when not? Third contentious issue, the definition of Sharia. Fourth contentious issue that he flies, the role of women. The role of women in society, but also politics, of course. Uh, relations with the West. Uh, another one, whether or not religious movements should form political parties. Right? Certainly a question that Salafists and others had asked themselves. So in other words, a, 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 a pretty long list. I think it actually is longer than the seven that he flagged in that particular uh, area. Uh, a list of contentious issues. Now, the book to me uh, puts forward a hopeful and optimistic agenda that these contentious issues can be reconciled um, within a, uh, in a peaceful manner. Ultimately that, sure, there's work to be done. We don't know exactly where we're going. Uh, but ultimately that uh, we can reconcile democracy, religious authority, as well as individual rights. Um, and my third question is this. Isn't it possible that these issues, which are extremely complicated and have many different points of view, isn't it possible that these issues superimposed on this reemergence of political Islam, going back to my first two observations, uh, that this set of issues reimposed on political Islam will in fact fracture Arab states internally, but also the Arab world more broadly. Um, that is to say, is this optimistic view still warranted um, given uh, these events today? Uh, fourth, and my final observation before I turn it over to Bob Rowley, um, uh, there's an interesting set of observations about technology and, and social networks and the role that technology has played in this movement, right? You've all heard about the ability of, of, of networks to pull activists together on short order, uh, flash mobs and things like that, not just in the Arab world, but, but elsewhere as well. Very interesting passage, by the way, about a Serbian activist who used uh, this means of technology to mobilize opposition to Milosevic, and then subsequently started a training program for activists on how to use this technology uh, to mobilize dissent. Um, so in that sense, uh, you know, in that sense, a, an optimistic reading of how technology, social networks could serve as a check on authoritarianism or resurgence of authoritarianism, whether that's religious or by the military, uh, an optimistic reading of technology and the ability of social networks. Yet at the same time, there's also uh, a recognition that um, the West was involved. Uh, he notes Google and the attempts of Google and others to steer the Arab Spring and the Arab Awakening in a particular direction that the West was involved. I think Bob will talk a little bit about uh, whether or not this, this, this influence on the role of the West is overstate, overstated or not, um, but a more pessimistic view. And of course we also know that authoritarian regimes will use technology themselves to steer public opinion and public debate. So uh, I, I wondered if you could say a few things about how he sees that play out, this role of technology and social networks as checks on uh, possible resurgence of authoritarianism, and also maybe he could comment on how he saw the role of the West during this Arab awakening in perhaps manipulating some of these exchanges. So those are my four observations, um, and perhaps pick and choose as you see fit. I mean, I certainly wouldn't want to uh, try to dictate the agenda, but perhaps those are some uh, starting points for our discussion. Uh, let me turn it over to Bob Rowley, Director of Media Relations here at Northwestern. Bob's been on the job for eight months, so I'm very happy to welcome him to Northwestern and, and to the Buffett Center. Bob, the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, can you hear me okay in the mic? Is that all right? Um, first, I want to welcome an old friend, Enamel Haq uh, from Elmhurst College, Professor of Religious Studies. We worked together when I was there. and. Um, Thank you again for inviting me to be here. I'm honored to meet uh, Dr. Ramadan. I've uh, read about him for years, and it's a pleasure to be on a panel with him. Um, I'm a recovering newspaper man. I was in newspapers for 30 years, and I was a foreign correspondent, and I'm based in the Middle East for four of those, but I covered it on and off for uh, 15 or 20 years. So that's where my interest and in, um, whatever expertise I bring to the table comes from. Um, I approached this uh, book. It, it, it was a fascinating and provocative book. But I, I approach it through the lens of someone who's lived in the Middle East and has covered its different peoples and religions and politics as a journalist. And I may take a less scholarly view than uh, some of the, my esteemed colleagues on the panel. Um, I, but I see the world in terms of its complexities, trying to understand them and to make sense of them to a general audience. And Professor Ramadan's book was an eye-opening one for me. 
because it helped me see the uprising more in terms of the historical, geopolitical, cultural, and religious context involved. He used several terms to describe these uprisings at the beginning of the book, including the one I understand best, Intifada. I lived in Jerusalem for four years in the 90s, so that was right between the two Palestinian intifadas. I went back and I covered the second one, mostly from Gaza. And intifada, as many of you here know, I'm sure, is widely translated as uprising in the Western media, which is fair, but it's literally more accurate uh, to translate it from the Arab Arabic as a shaking off. In the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians were trying to shake off the Israeli occupation, and I think that's a good way and a good definition to look at the Arab Spring. Um, and I'm going to touch on several of the points that Professor Sprite has already brought up, um, but I think they're the ones that jump out of me as well in the book. In the Arab uprisings, the young people, the men and women, the mostly Muslim demonstrators were trying on one level to shake off the dictatorships, repression, and cronyism in their societies. But Professor Ramadan's book awakened my understanding to another dimension at play here. We in the West, as uh, uh, Dr. Sprite said, we looked at the Arab awakening as a kind of uh, validation of our own modern Western values. The Arab and Muslim people were rising up without violence or rigid ideology to champion freedom, to protest the deplorable socioeconomic conditions, and to demand an end of dictatorship and corruption. So there's a bit of self-congratulation in our attitude towards this. We find ourselves a little patroni patronizingly saying, see, the Arab and Muslim peoples at heart are just like us, and I'm guilty of this too. And to some extent, I think that's absolutely true. These people in each case, in each country, sought democracy, freedom, justice, equality, autonomy, and pluralism. But that's also taking a view of the uprisings through a very rep Western lens, that they are aspiring to liberal Western values. Professor Ramadan writes that this view is fraught with serious consequences because we tend to misunderstand what's going on. And if we look at this again as if the West is somehow the superior ideal uh, and master over the East, which is its disciple, that's a reductive view in some ways. And as he puts it in the book, it amputates other civilizations of their creative potential. At a deeper level then, this is also an uprising or a shaking off of a kind of cultural imperial imperialism and vestiges of colonialism that the West has implanted for decades uh, in the Middle East and North Africa and from which the region is trying to awaken and move on. Dr. Ramadan's central question is whether Arab and Muslim societies can dig into their own grassroots, their own cultures, their own cultural references and their, their, his, their Islamic heritage and help contribute their own unique vision to a new world order, a vision not dictated solely by America and the West, but more representative of the new, representative of the new paradigms, the global south, the, the Islamic nations in general, and even the rising powers of Asia. And on a macro scale, I'm struck by how much the globalizing world is creating all this changing uh, all these changing paradigms of power, economics, alliances, and transformation. It's far more transnational, diverse, and multicultural, even as America itself is heading into a much more uh, domestically diverse, multicultural, majority-minority status before the middle of the century. The whole world is changing, and I, for one, see the Obama administration trying to adapt to those changes in its foreign policy, taking a more thoughtful approach, trying to acknowledge the value of other cultures and recognize that, and not always seeking to oppose, impose America's will or worldview in every instance. It's much more akin to the humble realism of Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, who's the president's favorite philosopher, reacting in a measured way to a flawed world and a world of contemporary changes and not thinking you can fix or control them all. And Dr. Ramadan's book reflects on the contemporary challenges facing Islam specifically and its place in the West and within Muslim societies in general. And I, I, I have to note that today marks 11 years and a day since the 9-11 attacks. And this book underscored for me the importance of America and the West looking beyond that binary, sterile, and pol polarizing debate that he talks about in the book between Islamism and secularism, secularism of us against them. I totally agree with him on this. Um, yes, there are still extremists out there, and in the last 24 hours, as you noticed, uh, we saw uh, an incredibly <coughs> uh, tragic event, an, uh, an outrageous attack on the U.S. ambassador in Libya that killed Ambassador Christopher Stevens and three other Americans who were with him. Um, and again, it, it grew out of um, 
I've only read brief accounts of this, but there was a video posted on the internet uh, insulting to the Prophet Muhammad, and it created demonstrations in Cairo and then uh, on into Libya. And so these, these issues are very real, and they're still out there, and they're minute by minute affecting all of us. But for me, there's not so much a clash of civilizations between <coughs> Islam and the West, as Samuel Huntington posited, as there is a debate within Islamic societies about the kind of modernity, the amount of reform those societies want to have. And certainly, Professor Ramadan supports and champions, uh, from my reading of his book, the Arab awakening protesters for their pursuit of liberty, the rule of law, freedom of religion, and the right to self-determination of all peoples. But he also raises difficult questions about the complexities of the uprisings and what they mean, what actually sparked them, and where they go from here. Just look at Syria to see the ugliest, most brutal, and dangerous result of what happens when a people rise up against a cruel and ruthless dictator. The U.S. hasn't gotten involved more there because we're not prepared to lose thousands more American lives in a place where we may or may not be able to make a difference and where we could easily touch off a wider conflict. Um, and I think that would all, those things would all happen if the U.S. were to intervene militarily. But it is also true that the Obama administration did not intervene militarily everywhere in the Arab Spring. They didn't go into Tunisia. They didn't go into Egypt's uprising. But it did back the, the NATO intervention to help Libya's rebels overthrow Muammar Gaddafi. Why? Well, the way we're viewed in the Arab world is often it's all about oil. And I think one of the obvious interests there was Libya's oil wealth. It exported 1.8 million barrels a day before the uprisings, and 80% of it was shipped to our allies in the European Union. Libya has the largest oil reserves in Africa and the fifth largest in the world. And I agree with the book's analysis here that America's vital interests still do play a major role, um, and economic interests are still a strong determin of our determinant of our foreign policy. But there are a few things that Dr. Ramadan raises in his book worth a little closer look, I think, in some critical analysis. One of the theses that impressed me, but I think still needs more study, is whether, in fact, the U.S. had a direct hand in sparking the uprises. Professor Ramadan points to the call by President George W. Bush way back in 2003 as he led America into what I consider an ill-considered war with Iraq, his call for the, the complete democratization of the Middle East. And the book details several cases of U.S.-funded training long before the uprisings of Arab and Muslims you, Muslim youth in the art of nonviolent protest and the use of web-based and social media, that indeed uh, these social media played a key role in the uprisings. And while he doesn't argue this caused the uprising, Dr. Ramadan does make the case that it played a larger role than has been so far revealed. And I think it's fascinating uh, research, and there may be some truth in this. Um, I th for my part, I think more investigation is needed. Um, to me, essentially, so much of these uprisings were uh, a long-held upwelling of long pent-up frustrations among Arab and Muslim peoples and a reaction to terrible economic circumstances, constant repression, and dictatorship. Moreover, once they were sparked, the youth especially used every bit of modern technology that they had at hand, whether it was cell phones or Facebook or Twitter, to spread the word, to organize the ranks, and to call people into the streets, even as the dictatorships tried to cut off those means of social media and new media. And I think in many ways it was the rise and influence of Al Jazeera uh, long before that helped set the stage for these result, re revolts, as, as indeed Dr. Ramadan mentions in his book. It helped fuel them as well with its 24-hour hour coverage to 40 million Arab viewers around the region when they were up and running. And uh, he makes the same point in his book. And the network, whatever its flaws, and, and the U.S. has had problems with it in the past, it was seen by the Arab peoples as a credible source of news and policy debate. Um, and also, it's been an alternative as, as a very credible voice in the minds of those people to the, the dictatorial, state-run television that they've been exposed to for the past decades. Um, and I think that prepared the way for the uprisings, uh, probably fundamentally, fundamentally more than other things um, that led up, led up to them. My years in the Middle East convinced me that people there also often saw the hand of the United States rightly or wrongly, behind so many of the things that befell them, and not always in a good way, and usually not in a good way. My experience is also the U.S. has, has never had anything close to complete success imposing its will there. Far from it. And even if George W. Bush had wanted to manipulate these peoples to rise up for democracy, the jury is still out on whether that 
is even <coughs> possible, in my view. Uh, I remember sitting with Palestinians in the Jabalia refugee camp in the Gaza Strip in February of 2003 on the eve of the Iraq War, and they all said the same thing. If America goes into Iraq, maybe not right away, but you will be greeted uh, with the same kind of um, uh, violent reaction and opposition from the people there that the Israelis are greeted with in the West Bank and Gaza for their occupation. Um, and it was the universally held view, I think, in a lot of Arab and Muslim countries as we went in there, and I think America uh, found, uh, found that exactly uh, when they went in. So to me, it remains to be seen uh, even whether uh, Iraq will be able to move towards a complete democracy um, now that U.S. forces have withdrawn. I think the jury's still out on that as well. Moreover, if Bush and Obama had been working quietly behind the scenes to spark the Arab Spring, this thesis can't explain what motivated such a radical change in longstanding U.S. policy. For decades, for better or for worse, Republican and Democratic administrations alike have consistently supported these authoritarian Arab regimes and strongmen, including Egypt's Hosni Mubarak, because they ensured a measure of stability and security for vital U.S. interests in the region, for the continued flow of oil, and for this tenuous and cold but so far enduring peace among some Arab nations and the U.S. Uh, strong ally, Israel, in the region. And Dr. Ramadan makes the point that the Arab awakening protests were rarely, if ever, anti-Western. That wasn't really on the agenda of these young folks when they rose up. Clearly, many Arabs and Muslims involved in the uprisings simply yearned for the freedom they saw flourishing elsewhere in the world. But to say they were partially manipulated or caused by the West still is a bit of a stretch for me, and I'd like to see more research on it. There was a profound awakening in the streets, and, I th and it was sparked, in this case, by the tragic self-immolation of the poor street vendor, Mohamed Bouazizi, in Tunisia in December of 2010, as you know. And that fire really ignited the spark that touched off the bigger wild wildfire of the protests across the region. And I think the U.S. was caught by surprise just as much as the authoritarian regimes there that were targeted, many of the regimes our government has supported over the years. And if the street vendor had not set himself ablaze, I think some other spark would have eventually ignited this uprising. It was brewing and ready to go. The question now is what comes next, and that is the heart of Dr. Ramadan's book. Even if the protesters came from all walks of life, men and women, Islamist and secular, youthful dreamers, hardened politicians, what they have unleashed are unfinished revolutions. Islamists have taken power in Tunisia and Egypt, but it's no surprise they won elections. These were the groups that were uh, in the opposition to these dictatorships. These were the groups that were repressed. These were the organized groups that, when you take away the dictator, naturally rise to the surface and reflect a lot of their um, followers in those countries, like the, Mo the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. They form the heart of the opposition facing the worst repression under the dictatorships, and their time has come. But how will they govern, and what kinds of new world order will they build from the roots of their Islamic heritage and their unique cultures? Um, and that's the most compelling call in this book to me, the call to reach into Arab heritage, to reach into Muslim heritage, to make um, a, a self-defined uh, world for themselves that's based on their culture and their history and their roots. And I think it's a really wise and uh, important call, and it's the heart of this book um, and uh, the heart of where we see the awakening now going. So thank you. So I'm delighted to be here to have the opportunity to discuss Professor Ramadan's book. Um, it's a really remarkable piece that requires a lot of thought, and I'll be thinking about it more. Um, I found the discussion of secularism and the kind of critical examination of what secularism is for, what it's doing, who is using it, I thought was pretty, pretty darn important to talk about. Uh, his call for, if I'm right, a recovery of an Islam-based ethic to inform a new politics for the global south is certainly worth talking about. And again, I want to echo uh, Henrik's point that really I wish Elizabeth Shackman Heard was here to discuss it because she really is a specialist on these matters. Um, but unfortunately, you, you, you got a person who studies U.S. foreign policy, so I'm going to have to focus on that. Um, again, I want to point out that the heart of the book that I just talked about is a really important thing to discuss. Um, and what I'm going to talk about now is other parts of the book that I would argue are not central to the book. One of them, U.S. foreign policy or the policy of the West, which I think gets too many pages in the book. And the other one is the institutions by which you can translate the ethics into politics, which are actually quite lacking in the book. 
and I know my colleague Rachel will be talking about that some more. Um, Professor Ramana is right in saying that the struggle within the Arab states is connected to the outside world. Um, and I think just today we hear the news that kind of the most basic norm of international law, the sanctity of diplomatic personnel has been violated, uh, much to the Libyan government's chagrin, it should be pointed out. Um, means that there is something to talk about here when we talk about foreign policy. Um, but I don't think it's exactly what Professor Ramadan is saying in the book. Um, when, I, when I read the description of the role of the West, and specifically the United States, and I'm going to focus on the United States today because that's what I know. Um, you know, I'm reminded of that Woody Allen joke where you have the two ladies in the restaurant and the one lady says, ah, oh, this food is terrible. And the other one says, oh yeah, in such small portions. Right? This, is, this is kind of, the United States really can't do much that's right. Um, and I actually tend to agree with Professor Ramadan on that. What I don't agree with Professor Ramadan is that, specifically, the United States is just not that special. Okay? The United States is just not that competent. And the United States is not, not even remotely a unitary, uh, coherent, or hegemonic actor. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the next two or three minutes. Um, I want to cite a really good quote of the book um, that describes the policy of Turkey, which I, I believe Professor Ramadan kind of holds up as a model for an Islam, not a model, but a, a potential route towards the end point, a means to an end, I believe you, you, you describe it. And Turkey has played a role, obviously, in the Arab uprisings, where they were kind of, they supported Tunisia, they were um, hesitant to engage with Syria, but eventually come around to condemning it. They called for the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya, I believe. They, again, eventually called for the, the the um, removal of Mubarak, right? These are, and they also trained activists in, in, uh, in various places, uh, specifically for Tunisia and Egypt, right? These are behaviors that were all done by the United States as well, okay? They're fairly similar to the United States uh, policy positions. And I would say that Professor Ramadan interprets the motives behind them differently. And my first point is basically, States, whether the United States or Turkey or whatever proper noun you assign to them, they kind of do the same thing internationally. And so when Professor Ramadan calls for uh, an increase in multipolarity as a way of opening space for this new ethic um, in the Arab world and the global south, um, I'm not sure that it will result in the emergence of alternatives because states tend to act the same way. Um, that's my first point. Um, secondly, states are not necessarily very coherent, especially the United States, as big and messy and rich as it is. Um, Professor Ramanad talks about the economic motive behind a lot of American activity. This is undeniably the case, but we don't want to overstate it, okay? Um, we spend a lot of time worrying about, uh, let's just call it the Arab League for just to have a nice tight set of, of countries. It's actually kind of a trivial market when you get right down to it. It's about the size, depending on who you're counting, somewhere between Spain and Germany, and that's almost all hydrocarbons. So the idea that you're opening up markets when you're interacting with this world, I mean, one of the big tragedies of this part of the planet is that they don't consume that much. They are not attractive markets for a lot of investment besides ExxonMobil. Um, I teach my students that the United States, for whatever reason, has three kind of distinct interests in this region, um, oil, Israel, and counterterrorism. And I'm pretty agnostic about why we have these interests. I'm pretty sure that we actually devote a little too much time and energy to all of these interests. But I think it's pretty hard to argue that those are um, three major goals in this region. The thing to understand about that is that they're in completely impossible to reconcile, right? You can't maximize all three goals at the same time. They're in tension with each other, okay? I might want to eat a ton of cake and fit into the jeans I wore in college, right? Those are both rational goals. I can't maximize them both at the same time. Okay? So when you have this set of goals, you're just not going to get a coherent foreign policy. It's just not going to happen. Okay? And then you throw in things like democratization and um, corporate profits, you're going to get a big mess. So given this arrangement of preferences, I just don't think you're ever going to see a coherent foreign policy by the United States in this part of the world. I mean, even our government-funded pro-democracy NGOs are funded along party lines, right? We don't just have one. We have a Republican one and we have a Democratic one, right? This is not a, rep a recipe for sort of a hegemonic kind of totalizing outlook on the world. Um, 
so Professor Ramana is right, and, and Bob is right to point out that the United States interacted with the various countries that were experiencing uh, the very aptly called Arab Awakening, and they handled it differently. And, but rather than in this kind of explanation of kind of a, a global effort by sort of Google, the IMF, Obama, the United States military, it's probably a simpler explanation just to say the United States has really uncertain preferences when it comes to these places. They're trying to hedge their bets. They're not necessarily competent in what they do. And just the world is really uncertain. So trying to find a pattern, and this is, this is not really something political science should say, say out loud, but sometimes things are just random noise, right? We, we don't necessarily find a, a, a pattern. And I think that's pretty important. Now, again, I want to emphasize, this is not the heart of the book, I think it's safe to say, okay? And so I'm wondering why it's brought in, and that's sort of what I would like to hear from Professor Ramadan um, if he, uh, he has to pick and choose what he responds to. Um, for me, it feels a little pro forma. It's sort of the equivalent of, um, I don't know, if you, if you go before the Supreme Court, you always cite Marbury versus Madison, right? Or if you're, if you're going out to dinner and you tell your partner that their outfit looks great, okay? It's neither here nor there. It just gets you out the door, okay? And so a lot of this uh, critique of the United States and the West seems to be it, doesn't, it just gets us out the door to what Professor Ramadan really wants us to engage with, which is this establishment of a new politics in this part of the world. Um, now, the problem is, uh, even though it is pro forma, um, even though it is something that kind of lots of people say, not just Professor Ramadan, in fact, I've been known to say it myself when I teach US foreign policy, um, it, is, it does have consequences, right? Engaging the West, the United States, um, even Barack Obama as a unitary actor is, is not easy, okay? And uh, Professor Ramadan, part of Professor Ramadan's entire career is basically warning against a sort of Western conception, a totalizing conception of Islam, of the Arab world, of the global south. And I would argue that having hegemonic conceptions of what the United States, the West is doing, is also dangerous. I mean, you know, the behavior of a knucklehead like Terry Jones, right, um, has really tragic consequences, right? And that is part of the problem we're talking about here. Um, now, the more positive uh, thing I'd love to hear about, and thankfully, Professor Robin is so productive that I'm sure he's got a book on this on the way, um, is the focus on institutions, the need for institutions to translate the ethics that Professor Ramadan is advocating into sustained action and civil society, okay? One of the reasons why Hezbollah and, and, uh, and the Muslim Brotherhood in its various forms and the militaries in a lot of these countries are important is because they're heavily institutionalized, okay? They work, okay? It's not easy to make institutions. Okay, it's not easy to make grassroots roots institutions, no matter what Twitter and Google will tell you. Okay, most of the time, institutions come from somewhere. Okay, and now all institutions, just like ideology, just like language, just like a business contract, are shot through with power. Okay, institutions are not neutral. Okay, the IMF is not neutral. Okay, the UN Security Council is not fair. Okay, these are designed to do something for certain actors. Okay. But not having any institutions is going to result in failure. Develop them by oneself is almost impossible. And given the arguments of Professor Ramadan that I was talking about before, borrowing them from abroad seems pretty anathema too. And so what I would like to know, and I think a lot of us around the world should consider, not just Professor Ramadan, right, is what institutions are needed and how can they be developed? How can they be borrowed? How can they be um, reconciled with what Professor Ramadan very nicely calls the particular genius of Islam or the Arab world. Um, that's not part of this book. Um, maybe it shouldn't be part of this book, but I think it should be part of future conversations around this book. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, uh, for laying out some of the talking points very nicely. I'll try to um, add something to this discussion by focusing on the domestic nature of the civil society movements and what they mean for democratization and for what Dr. Ramadan describes as establishing a new socioeconomic and political order. So 
in the book, I, I think that Dr. R Ramadan articulates very well and names the Arab Awakening as a set of transnational mass movements. Indeed, they're movements by and of civil society. And he says that they have achieved what we don't, uh, a certain type of irreversible change. That is, we don't know yet the outcomes. We don't know yet uh, where each movement will go in all of its diversity and all of the uncertainty that surrounds it. But we do know that some element of irreversible change has taken place. And I agree completely with this argument. I think that the uprisings themselves do share um, certain characteristics that they were protests against socioeconomic and uh, social conditions, that they were about the rejection of dictatorship, that they were about fights against corruption, that there were these structural socioeconomic and political contexts that, that created these na transnational mass movements that rallied the people to be able to oust dictators. And so the very fact that the outcomes are yet uncertain and that there's this high degree of political uncertainty that, that remains in each country does not negate that there has been a certain emancipation of society and of the mind that he, that he describes. I think that this is a global phenomenon. When it, hap when it happens this way, that a public begins to know their own power, when a public begins to realize and actually experiences the fact that they can change the status quo the fact that they can rally and oust a dictator, the fact that they can unify against what was imposed upon them, certainly it increases the uncertainty of the political environment because it gives the public confidence that they do not need to endure that type of tyranny, that they hold the power today and that they hold the power at some future point if necessary to be able to uh, actually protest against these types of tyranny and they have the potential to suggest um, ways in which a new order could be established. It does not guarantee that a new order will be established. It doesn't guarantee the content of that new order, but it provides that opportunity. And I think that that is indeed irrever irreversible change. And I think it's, it's the kind of cautious optimism that Ramadan uh, suggests and is well placed. The question is then really what comes next? And I think that he deals with this um, in many forms, and I think it is indeed a, a a very appropriate question. How do these uprisings, how do these civil society movements translate into a new order? Um, how does it continue to encompass all walks of life? What struck us so much about the civil society movements was that they were across different classes, that they, were, uh, that they had encompassed religious diversity, that they encompassed all ages from the youth to the, to the elderly, that they encompassed men and women. How does this diverse coalition then move forward to provide an agenda for a coherent future, um, to establish a civil state with religious pluralism, to establish justice and liberty. Those are really the questions that I think we need to take moving forward and that, that Dr. Ramadan raises in the book. How does the civil society imagine and then make real, actually activate a new type of socioeconomic and political order? So we have seen um, in what has already happened that the mass transnational movement is actually quite well suited for rallying against something, to undo the dictatorship. But it is less well suited for coherent action to devise a new system. In the void and the chasm of the breakdown of the old system, those with pre-existing organizational networks, those with resources, those who can build upon established institutions such as the Muslim Brotherhood, have an early advantage in dictating the terms of a new system, of a new order. So that we see that the strongest and best organized political parties that emerge are those that have an institutional history within each country, those that have social roots within the country, those that have been providing public services. Institutions facilitate political action. So political parties or organizations that were already in place have that early mover advantage. They can provide the glue that organizes diverse actions. And in setting suggestions for which new rules will be taken up in terms of the nature of the Constitution, in, the, in terms of the nature of electoral competition, in every domain, they provide a kind of orientation that can then guide strategic action around them. And so a diverse and multi-class civil society movement quickly melts away. And it, because it cannot sustain that kind of frenzied support that was necessary for undoing the tyranny 
uh, and the limitations of repression. The differences now between those diverse groups that made up the civil society movement begin to appear. How will the new rules benefit those who currently hold power and resources? And that is really, I think, the question that is being played out in these diverse contexts across each country. So when we think about collective action, it supports the idea that coherence against some existing evil is, is possible to sustain, but divisions are likely to arise with attempts to build something new. So relying on civil society alone to build and to suggest this new model of political organization will be difficult, particularly because civil society itself in the historical period prior to these uprisings was thwarted and repressed and limited in very specific ways during the decades of autocratic rule. So where we stand today is that new political organizations are weak and therefore the remnants of the old regime itself will still loom large in developing the new order. So the, the most solid foundation upon which new political parties and new actors can build is often trying to look to the past and to take up some elements of old orders. So looking carefully at the Eastern European exa uh, examples for, ex for, uh, for their experiences suggests that some of the communist parties that had what were called transferable skills were able to reinvent themselves to get reelected. Those that had experience with internal party organization, those that had directly cultivated a grassroots membership and provided services. Those parties were able to reinvent themselves and become electorally competitive in future rounds. And I think that this example is transferable to the early victories of political parties that we've seen and witnessed thus far in Tunisia and Egypt. The experience in sub-Saharan Africa of democratic uprisings, uprisings in the early 1990s also parallels the Arab awakening in some respects and provides insights on the possible paths forward of the ways in which institutional institutions themselves channel competing demands in a pluralistic and civic state. So in a very similar way there was a kind of regional snowball of movement from purely autocratic single party regimes to competitive multi-party elections. And the degree of democratization was unclear at that point and is still very varied across the continent of sub of across sub-Saharan Africa. And whether or not old aut autocrats would be ousted was also unclear. But again, an irreversible change had taken place that meant that people had spoken and status quo was changed. The reforms were achieved to, uh, to move to multi-party elections. And what's striking is that the, the countries that had the most institutionalized political parties, the places where the autocratic political parties were the strongest, were those that developed going forward once multi-party competition was introduced, that developed long-term opportunities for increasing liberty, for increasing justice, and for increasing the meaningful uh, engagement in political competition. Because these political parties themselves did not necessarily need to be pro-democratic, but by engaging, by different power groups engaging over contestation, over contestation for access to the state, over contestation for electoral office, they broke open in an evolutionary process, in a very slow and tedious process, they broke open greater space for equality and liber liberty and justice and freedom. And I think that this experience also might speak to the Arab awakenings in the ways in which the pluralistic environment itself creates an opportunity for strongly institutionalized parties to compete within a rule-bounded environment and to create a collective political conscience in an evolutionary process. So I would suggest also that from this experience, internal conflict and where there is a lack of state security, it can prohibit this kind of um, ongoing evolutionary liberalization um, because there is not that kind of rule of law that can provide for uh, the rule-bound competition between competing parties. The other institution that I want to highlight and, and discuss a little further, and I hope that Dr. Ramadan will pick this up in his comments, is the military. So he certainly points to the military as a key institution in the various countries that he describes, and he goes through quite interesting empirical detail to describe the role that each military has played, and um, particularly in their dealings with the West, in Egypt and in and Tunisia. But I think 
the most interesting question is whether or not the militaries in each country first remained neutral during the uprisings themselves. So in Egypt and Tunisia, they did indeed remain neutral and did not intervene. Whereas in um, Libya and, and Syria, we know, and, and, and elsewhere, uh, the, the militaries remained loyal to the commander in chief and were willing to attack and use violence against the opposition, against the uprising. So this seems to be one of the crucial questions to me that underlies how the uprisings themselves unfolded, what form they took. Um, and to me, I think it will certainly loom large in establishing the new type of socio-political order that Ramadan suggests is necessary. The question here, I think, is historical as well as, as looking into the future. How did the militaries themselves come to be the institutions that they are today? What type of recruitment patterns did they have? Did they have uh, a type of national recruitment that required all to serve, that made the, the body of the military itself nationally representative? Or did they have patterns of recruitment that reflected the priority, particularly in the military elite, of a certain ethnic or religious grouping that needed then to protect their position within that institution and to protect the regime as well? So I think that the nature of the military as an institution speaks loudly to the forms that the uprisings themselves took and to what potential uh, the military might have going forward to be a neutral arbitrar, to be a protector of the new order that could be established. In, in order to conclude, I have one final question, and I want to return in that to the key theme that Dr. Ramadan narrates in his book, and that is the crisis of the polarizing debate between secularists and Islamists. So he describes with great care how the polarization of this debate itself, I think, is an empty, empty controversy that is both artificial as well as ideologically and po politically motivated. He posits a world in which the interface between ethics, which are inspired by religion, collective intelligence, and, and culture, in his words, and the administration of state affairs could be articulated. So to quote, I think, from a very um, profound passage, he says, religion is not a closed, irretrievably separate framework that imposes itself upon the political domain, but a corpus of principles and objective capable of orienting and inspiring political action. Respect for the popular will and the mandates of elected representatives, the promotion of equality, justice, and education, the fight against corruption, cronyism, and illeg illegitimate rule, all must bow before a structure of political ethics. So this is the future that he envisions, and one that we are all tasked to, uh, I think, uh, ad admire as an alternative possibility. And this is a debate, obviously, that ranges across the world. It's not limited to, uh, to the Arab uh, uh, awakening. So Ramadan suggests that Tunisia itself has seemed to avoid the stale polarization between an Islamist discourse and a secularist discourse course, and that has been reflected in their recent electoral competitions. And that Turkey, too, provides not necessarily an outcome that needs to be emulated, but a means to that outcome, a way to navigate the process. And I want to know more from him, then, how has this been allowed to work in some countries? How have some places and contexts seemed to move beyond or around this polarizing form framework? And what does that mean for the possibility of others to find a new model for the nature of the state, the role of religion, and the basic principles of equal rights for all citizens? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you so much first for being here for this invitation. It's the second time I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm very happy because the last time I came, I also had the uh, uh, experience of very interesting discussions with uh, 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 professors here and students. And I'm very happy to be here when the, the book is just uh, being released. And you should be ready for three hours now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, covering all these points. And I'm very, very uh, grateful for uh, your comments and, and what you uh, uh, brought into the discussion, because I think that the main points were uh, tackled. And uh, as much as I'm trying to study what is happening, 
In fact, all I have been doing over the last 30 years is covering three areas. One is from within the Islamic tradition, uh, what we call fiqh, uh, Islamic law and jurisprudence, and usul al-fiqh, the fundamentals, and trying to come with a critical uh, approach. And this is, for example, I try to summarize all this in the book, uh, Radical Reform, Islamic Ethics and Liberation, in which way we can reform our understanding saying that to claim that we have to reform Islam doesn't mean anything, but we have to reform the Muslim minds and the Muslim interpretations. So this is one field. The other is, of course, what I was and I'm still trying to do in the West, dealing with Western Muslims' issue. And, and in fact, one of the points you raised at the end is something that I will come in our relationship between our experience in the West and the experience of Muslims in Muslim-majority countries. And the, the third area is, in fact, uh, what is happening in Muslim-majority countries, and this book is very much about this, and trying to understand uh, what we called the Arab Spring and revolution. So I think it was said, and I repeat this, uh, because it's the starting point of my discussion. So I understood through all my studies that terminology matters and the words that you are using are so important. So to celebrate very quickly that we are dealing with spring and, and coming with the term that was taken from the Eastern European uh, revolutions and say this is the spring and then we are uh, talking about revolutions, I was very cautious with the terminology and I tried to understand and to in fact try to find out what we knew before. And uh, uh, this is why, why I was saying I still don't know if we are dealing with unfinished or unachieved revolutions, but there is something, and I think that this is the starting point of our discussion, and this is why I am positive while cautiously optimistic, is what you said uh, at the end is there is something which is irreversible. And this awakening is what I call an intellectual revolution, so that the people are now getting a sense that they can make it, that they can uh, uh, throw dictators, that they can change regimes, that something could happen within the society. At the end of the day, it was the only region in the world which was not experiencing changes over the last 30 years. It happened in South America, it happened in, uh, in Africa, but not really in the Middle East. So this is something for me which is uh, uh, cautious with terms, and concepts and quite clear on where we should focus when it comes to our optimism for the future, uh, that there is something which is happening in the Muslim majority countries. And for the Muslims, coming back to their reference, to understand that they have to take a tri critical stand in their way of dealing with the reference is they want to face up to the challenges of our time. And what happened uh, yesterday that we have to condemn, uh, these uh, uh, actions are once again messages sent to the Muslim conscience. You have to take a stand and to decide which kind of interpretations you are supporting as Muslims. Uh, it's, it's, it's critical here and it's going to be more and more critical as the societies are opening up towards you know, values of freedom and uh, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, this is, you know, when you are facing a dictator, it's quite, uh, uh, it's uh, easier to say, okay, we cannot speak because the dictator is here. But when we are uh, now advocating and supporting and in fact experiencing society where it is, uh, uh, more, it's possible to speak out and it's necessary to speak out, we have to do it. Uh, uh, I, I just want to summarize all my uh, responses in three main points, just to understand from where uh, I stand and, and all the, the, so sometimes I will refer to one of the questions, but uh, the first area is the West, and in which way I think we have to deal with uh, the situation. All these discussions that we have, telling us that nobody knew what was happening in the Middle East, or in Tunisia, all this is wrong. That's not true. It's true that on socioeconomic terms, as you said, it was known that the people were facing 
corruption, poverty, and many people were visiting Egypt saying it's going to explode. It's implode from within. There is something wrong in the whole process. Corruption is everywhere. The people don't, cannot just uh, uh, survive. Something is going to happen. The same was said about Tunisia. So the same ingredients were there. So it's only because of these ingredients that it was possible for the people to mobilize. That's for sure. That's, there is no discussion about this. The point is not that. The point is to say, OK, in which way these people were pushed. And I think we didn't uh, study enough what happened in Eastern Europe with all this philosophy of nonviolent mobilization against Milosevic. And it became something which was a philosophy. Serja Popovic, with whom I have a very long debate on Dubai TV, was telling me it became a philosophy. We were working on it. And it's something which is a vision for the future. How do we use Facebook, social networks, in order to mobilize people? And he himself acknowledged the fact that the first uh, who trained them was someone who was coming from the American army. He acknowledged, he said, yes, but you know what? He was retired. Thank you, he was retired, but still, it's coming from somewhere. So the point for me is just to say, okay, we have this. Does it mean that everything was under the control that, uh, you know, uh, implicitly that the American government knows everything about uh, everything? No, I'm not saying this. I'm saying that there was, and there still is a geostrategic and economic interest towards democratization in the region. This is my point. Now, the point that it was not under control is what is happening in Syria. For eight months, the American administration and all the European administrations were supporting the regime, saying we want Bashar al-Assad to reform the regime from within. And they changed, and even Turkey was having exactly the same position, asking Bashar al-Assad, stay but reform, and he didn't. And then they understood that the people are not going to stop. So they were looking for people in the opposition to deal with. Why? Because mainly the leading force in Syria were Islamists, again, and the Muslim Brotherhood were very much, and not only the Muslim Brotherhood, but people who were not very happy from the leftist uh, 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 hand side of the political spectrum with America, with the states. So they took six, seven months to find people with whom they can deal. And I think that we have to take this into account that this was not in the agenda to change this in the region, even though afterward uh, there are very uh, uh, in, uh, great interest in having Syria very close to the United States and to uh, promote the divide between the Shia and the Sunni in the region. This is another story, but I think that now we have to think about uh, plans that are changing as things are moving. But my, my, my point here when uh, answering this is to say, uh, if you look at all what we knew, if we look, for example, at the American ambassador writing in 2008, there are young people who are trained on, uh, uh, with you know, uh, uh, social networks, and they want to get rid of Mubarak by September 2011, before 2000. This was written in 2008, and the American ambassador knew it. And not only the American ambassador knew it, but also Mubarak knew it, because these people who came back from the States were arrested in Cairo. Hmm. So it's not a surprise for all the people. Now, more than that, if you read what the French are saying about what happened in Tunisia and the way the American administration, from the very beginning, were involved in the way Ben Ali left the country, and in fact, Ending up for Ben Ali <coughs> in Riyadh without Washington knowing it, I don't buy this. I don't buy it. So I think that even the French are saying the, the Americans were involved. What I'm saying here is this push towards democratization is not only coming from the people, it's coming from helping this awakening to happen. And the ingredients, corruption, poverty, are part of the whole process. This is very important. Does it mean that it's a, a global conspiracy? No, I think that democracies were needed in the region, but not for political reasons. And this is the answer that I can give, and I try to give it in the book. We are too much focused on politics and political structures. We speak about democracy, freedom, and justice, that's all fine. The beginning of the whole process is just socioeconomic problems that the people are facing. At the end of the day, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi uh, killed himself because he was facing poverty and he was facing you know, lack of dignity in anything which has to be survival for him. And this is the situation in Egypt and this is the situation in Tunisia. Now, 
If we look at the last 10 years, why it was necessary for the American and European, for the Western policies to change, it's not because they like democracy more than dictatorships. They are ready to deal with dictators when they protect their interests. So why, for example, they were so silent in Bahrain? Because if Bahrain was to uh, fall, it would have been a problem with all the petro monarchies. So they were supporting Saudi Arabia, supporting the regime, saying, oh, these are all Shia against the Sunni. So we, are, we have countries that are protected and other countries that are not so protected. And now we come to another assessment, which is over the last 10 years, if it's not so important, if the only interest is uh, oil and Israel and uh, terrorism, by the way, I completely agree with this. I think that this is true. Now, what about the new actors in the region? the new economic actors. Over the last eight years, China multiplied by seven its economic presence in the region. India, what we know the BRIC uh, countries, Brazil, Russia, India, um, China, add to this now Turkey, South Africa, uh, and uh, Indonesia, that are now much more present in the region. And there is a shift towards the east. And then you understand that uh, it might be that corrupt regime could deal with the East in another way than the West. For example, Gamal Mubarak was starting to deal with China in a way which was very dangerous for the, the US administration. So I think that on this, we have to come with a comprehensive approach, which is not only to deal with political structures, and, but geostrategy. And as you said, there is something which is going to be very dangerous for the Middle East and the US equation in the Middle East. As you said, oil, it's important. So, so far, I would say that uh, I'm far for thinking that the US administration is doing things and knowing everything everywhere in a perfect way. I'm quite critical and there are very uh, uh, situations where it's clear that uh, they are not doing well. But if you look at the way they dealt with Libya, if the, the, way, the way they are dealing with, this, with the crisis, many people are saying they are not going to be involved in Syria. What if there is an agreement between the, the great powers that it might be good not to have an agreement too soon on Syria? What about what is happening now about the, the, the reality of their protection in Afghanistan, because in political terms, we can say Iraq is a failure, Afghanistan is a trap, still in economic terms, not so much. It works quite, quite well. In economic terms, the American interest in Afghanistan and in Iraq are protected, and very much in Libya. Hmm. So it might be that we have to add other factors here, and this is what I'm just saying in the whole process, and this is why I want the people, and why am I referring to this, and you're asking why I'm br uh, bringing this into the discussion, is just to say, don't be naive. There are uh, regional, international, transnational interests that have to be taken into account. Add to this something that you refer to, which is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, anything in the coming future, which is going to shift the center of gravity of economic power towards the East is going to be problematic for Israel. Why? Because China, India, Russia, they don't have the same relationship with Israel as the United States of America, and this is critical. Remember the first statement coming from Israel, we have to support Mubarak. So as if, you know, dictatorships around us is, is protecting us. But at the same time, I think here we have something which is uh, uh, a reality that we have to consider in the Middle East. So this is why I'm bringing this as something which is essential, which is not the heart of the book, but it's the envelope, <coughs> is from where the message is sent, uh, in order to say to people, be careful, there are things here that are not so simple, and uh, we have to deal with it in a way which is uh, important. What you said about the neutrality of the army, for example, no, when the army is not acting, it's not neutral. It's taking a stand, which is to be the understand of the people. And it means that there was something which was clear in Tunisia and in Egypt that they don't have to uh, intervene and they didn't want to intervene, 
Uh, but we also know that uh, the army, for example, in Egypt, part of the army, because they were internal uh, discussion. You know, when I, I had a very hot discussion with the personal advisor to Sarkozy about Libya, and he, uh, he was telling me, we went there for humanitarian reasons. I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, I, I, okay, I will, I will pretend I buy it. And, uh, but he was telling me about Egypt. He was telling me about Egypt. In Egypt, it's not a revolution. In Egypt, it's a coup d'etat. So this is the personal advisor to Sarkozy telling me that what was happening in Egypt is a conflict between, from within the army, between people who wanted Mubarak to protect their interests and others who wanted to change Mubarak but still to take over power. And up to now, what I'm saying is that all the people who think that the Muslim Brotherhood have the upper hand on the state are dreaming. It's not. I heard before Tantawi was dismissed that there is an agreement that Tantawi is going to be dismissed three days before. So the, the, this idea that everything is coming now, so there is a deal here between the Muslim Brotherhood and the army in the way they have to show a civil state while the army is very much uh, acting. And what you said about the army, it's also very important because the army is not only political power. It's half of the economic interest in Egypt is connected in one way or in another with the army. Half of the economic interests are connected in one way or they are involved in this. I think that we have to take this into account as an institution that it's not only in political terms to be considered, but in economic terms and in regional terms. So this is why I want to just to, to make it clear why I'm talking about this. And talking about this also because we need to deal with who is supporting whom. Uh, the petromonarchies, we all know, we know we very often in our media and even in, in academic setting, we speak about Salafiya and we speak about Wahhabi. And say, oh, they are Wahhabi. So in fact, they don't call themselves Wahhabi, they are Salafi. And Salafi literalists are the people who are very much, you know, uh, dealing with a literalist way. Uh, uh, they, they are dealing with the text in a very literalist way. If you look at what happened, for example, Rand Corporation, uh, 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 and I, you will find all this, many of the things are in the book and I, I, I kept on writing afterward on my website and coming with facts. Rand Corporation is telling us, and it's, a it's, an, uh, uh, it's in the book, it's the Salafi equation. $80 million were put by Qatari and Saudi organizations to support the Salafi El Nur party in Egypt. In fact, to push them. And the Salafi literalist, there is something which is very new for all of us. But if we had to study what happened in Afghanistan, we would uh, uh, have understood that it's very tricky. You know the Taliban in the 90s, they were not at all involved in politics. They were pushed towards politics to resist the Russian presence. Who pushed them? Two uh, political forces, first the Saudi and behind them the American. They pushed them as a resistance. So people who are not involved in politics could be used in politics. And the problem with these people is that they are very religiously sincere, very politically naive. And it means that these are the, the more dangerous people you can deal with. When you have people who are religiously sincere and politically naive, you will find behind them people who are politically very smart and religiously not sincere at all. And this is what is happening. Look at what is happening today in Egypt. They were pushed, and in less than eight months, they got 24% in the first election in the parliament. And in uh, uh, Tunisia today, it's unsettled why? Because the Salafi are, are here. And for the first time over the last three years, the Salafi who, was ag who were against de democracy and politics are now involved in politics and very close sometimes to very violent extremist trends. North Mali, Northern Mali, this is what we have now, and what happened in Libya and what happened in Egypt. The great majority of the people who are demonstrating are coming from the Salafi trend. The Salafi trend connected to violent extremist position. Who is pushing the Salafi from within to divide something that could be a movement for change? Very important question. I wouldn't say it's only the Americans. And I wouldn't say it's only coming from within. There is a game here that we have to understand. And the Muslims should be aware that two of the main challenges that they have today is internal tensions and interpretations between the Salafi, the reformists, the rationalists, the Sufi. This is a critical question. And the second between the Sunni and the Shia. 
And the problem is that we don't have too many intellectuals and Muslim scholars standing up and saying Sunni and Shia are Muslims. And we have to rely on principles and not to play, you know, the intra or sectarian divisions. That we have now Shia saying, you know, this is the first time in my life I get so many insults on my website by people saying, if you support the resistance in Syria, it's because you are Sunni. It's because you are close to Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And this is why you are supporting. And they are supporting the uh, Bashar because he is Shiai or because he's resisting the uh, petro monarchies. Uh, and now the political terms become sectarian religious terms. Very dangerous. And the scholars are buying it, supporting it. And, and you know what happened in, even in Bahrain. It was said that the Shia was, were behind the whole process and the, the state was protected in order to protect the Sunni tradition from Shia rebels. And, and not talking about the reality of the, 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 the political system. I think that we have to be deep on this. It's, it's difficult. So I'm just trying to come with all these dimensions to make it clear that it's very complex. We should not be naive, but we should understand where these trends are playing and how they are playing. Very quickly about the, the other points that were uh, made here, which uh, as it was said, uh, I, I, I repeated this and I, I tried to analyze in the book this tension, this polarization between secularist and Islamist. And you mentioned this and I think that it's not coming from the West. All the people are saying, oh, this polarization is coming from the West. It's true that the West is looking at these realities as you know, secularist and Islamist. But unfortunately, if you visit the Muslim majority countries, it's there. It's there. I was in Tunisia. I was caught between this discussion between the secularists and the Islamists. And, and, and at the end, the political discussion is very superficial because the Islamists are uh, justifying the presence by saying, you are westernized and we are the guardian of religion. And the secularists are saying, you are backward and you are, we are promoting progressive thoughts. So we have two political trends that are justifying the presence by the opposition to the other not with a, polit uh, a social policy, uh, an economic policy, or having a vision for the future. So we have to get rid of this, and this, we have, this is a trap in our discussion in the Muslim uh, majority countries today. It's clear that it happened, uh, it's happening now uh, uh, in, uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya. And the point is that what you were saying about the civil society, and this is the point of Ser Serja Popovic and many people who were acting. The point was the threats of the mass demonstrations uh, was that they were beyond ideology and political affiliation. It was against him. And there is something which is studied very, very deeply in if you want to unify the people. And this is why maybe it didn't work in Algeria, for example, because it was very much connected to political parties, is you target the dictator and you only have positive slogans about the people who are resisting and negative against only the dictator. And this is why we didn't have slogans against the West or against Israel. And it happened even in, in uh, Midan et Tahrir that someone wanted to start talking about Israel. Someone told him, Shut up, that's not the discussion here. The discussion is Mubarak and the regime. So this is something which is the strength was against one. The weakness is what after that? And this is what we are experiencing now. It's a weakness in the civil society in the Muslim majority countries. And beyond the polarization, we don't have critical, political, social, economic discussions. We don't. And, uh, we are trying to find models, by the way, and this is what I, I you know, you, 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 you thought or, uh, that I was referring. I'm very critical with Turkey, while I'm saying uh, at the same time, what was said about Turkey 10 years ago, there are Islamists that are going to impose Sharia, is just uh, proven wrong But what they are doing. And they are very effective in economic terms. Still, they have problems with minorities. Uh, you know, power can corrupt sometimes in the vision that you have to stay. Uh, from prime minister to president, and, and all these things have to be uh, uh, discussed. While I'm saying that it's true that the young generations of Islamists were much more attracted by Turkey than Iran. And this is a very important sign that, you know, he was able in July 2010 or 11, I don't remember, he went there and he was saying to the uh, to the, 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 the people, the Islamists, don't be scared of the secular system. This was Erdogan going to Egypt and saying this. 
So I think that in political terms, it's interesting because he's working from within the system. This is what I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying that there is here a way to discuss, even though we have to be critical with some of the political decisions and maybe also the economic vision for the future. Uh, but and at the, on the other side, we had people saying, oh, we have to look at the Western models. And my position on this is neither nor. You can't, there is no model today. And I'm uh, referring to, to, you refer to uh, an excerpt of the book where I'm, I'm setting some of the principles uh, that we have to rely, that for me are, are undisputable. They should be the, the, the basis of what the Muslim majority countries should come uh, to when it comes to rule of law, equal citizenship, uh, universal suffrage, accountability, separation of power, and uh, uh, distinguishing religious authority from the state authority. I think that these are principles that are very important and should be discussed from within, and they are discussed from within. Now, we have lots of problems, and many of the problems you refer to are critical, and we don't have answer. And the point for me when I, I, I respond to this is, for example, when we deal with uh, the nature of the state, all the Islamists are now saying, we are not almost all, except the Salafi and some, still some minority groups are saying, we are not advocating an Islamic state. We are advocating a civil state with Islamic reference. Okay, that's good. What does it mean? What does it mean exactly when it comes, for example, to uh, equal rights, when it comes to freedom of expression, when it comes to the role of the Islamic ethics, and this is what I'm advocating, Islamic ethics, and anyone who is telling me, you know, the state is completely uh, 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 divorced from anything which is religious, that's not true even in the United States of America, even in France, uh, saying that we are the only true secular state in the world. You say, I'm sorry, there is still some religious reminiscence somewhere in your uh, collective psychology. So it's the way you are articulating the two references that, 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 that is important. But what you are saying is, is true. Uh, when it comes to the Islamic uh, frame of reference, you can see that uh, among the Muslims, it's very problematic. It's very problematic between the literalist and between the reformist in which way it's going to play. And in which way, for example, look at the reaction uh, against this movie. By the way, there are two interpretations. It could be against the movie or it could be also because uh, s uh, someone from Al-Qaeda was killed in June. Uh, at the end of the day, the reaction, the emotional reaction, is something which is very important why because not only we have populists in the west but we have religious populists in muslim majority countries they are trying to get the emotions of the people and if you have something like what happened you know with this movie they will attract and there is something which is at stake when you have an islamic reference you have a question of credibility who are the credible uh, uh, reference when it comes so you have the reformists for example the discussion between the salafi and the discussion between the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, the Tunisian Nahda and the Salafi, exactly the same in Libya. So when they are now reacting against the movie, they get an emotional credibility. We are the guardian of religion. And if there is not a critical discussion coming from, the with from within the society, and as you are saying, I think it's a very important question, is how do we institutionalize this debate? It's not there. Today, we are dealing with emotional politics, with religion, are with fear uh, as we have with the Tea Party and the neocon in this country. It's also something which is a, a, a problem. So, so my point here is really to, to say uh, that the nature of the Islamic reference has to be discussed. And my, my the, 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 the heart of the book really in what you were saying is to come to what are the challenges the Muslim majority countries are facing. The nature of the state and in which way the state, the bottom up, uh, process of you know uh, uh, giving authority to the state the way the, the Islamic uh, reference is going to be uh, uh, used has to do also with different consequences the way now we have to deal with corruption in the Muslim uh, majority countries is essential nothing which is not <coughs> if it's not you know this uh, uh, um, policy against corruption within the, within the societies is, is critical. You can see this everywhere when you go in the Muslim majority countries, corruption is one of the main challenges. Education. And this is where I think in the West we have to be a bit deeper in our understanding. And once again, the West is part of the discussion. You know, 
I keep on repeating, if you want to talk about empowerment of women in the Muslim majority society, don't start counting the headscarves in the streets. And say, okay, look, it's dangerous. Too many headscarves, the women are now being more discriminated. There are two parameters that are very important. And if you listen to the Islamist or you listen to the secularist, you don't have an answer. Which kind of educational uh, 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 policy are you going to have to promote education for men and women in the society? Empowerment of women is about education. It's also about the job market. We don't have this kind of discussion today, and this is part of how the Islamic ethics could be something which is promoting that. Uh, and this is also something that uh, uh, it's important for us to the interpretation. No one can now predict who is going to have the upper end on the interpretation. And the more we have populists in the West, the more the populists in the Muslim majority countries are going to play a role by saying we are the guardian and the symbols are going to be much more important than policies. And when the symbols are more important than policies, we are all lost. The democratic values are lost because this is just uh, playing with our fears and our emotions to just to get the support. And I think that uh, this is important. Social justice is important. And once again, uh, uh, what I'm always uh, saying about the economic choices, it's an, it's an important factor. We, we can't just rely on uh, democratization of the society. There is no democratization without economic stability. And the economic stability is very much about uh, which kind of uh, economy and economic system. Turkey is welcome because Turkey went into the mainstream economic order. We don't have a problem with Islamists if they agree with this. The petro monarchies are quite fine. Go ahead. Do what you want with your women as long as your money is our, in our banks. That's fine. Uh, as long as you are protecting oil, that's fine. We don't care about human rights <coughs> when we are protecting our interests. Now, uh, is this the future for Egypt? just to deal with IMF or the World Bank? Is it the future for uh, Tunisia to accept the deal? And straight away, remember Barack Obama's uh, uh, talk when he spoke about the Arab awakening? Half of the discussion was about economy. We are going to give money, we are going to support, we are going to be there. And this is in economic terms, there is there something that could come from the Muslim majority countries about dealing with a multipolar world, understanding the new role of China, southeastern countries and the south. And this is why, for example, I'm critical of the choices of Turkey in many fields, but there is something which is important when we see that over the last five years they opened almost 40 embassies in southern countries in Africa. So they are shifting towards, you know, they were refused by the EU, say, okay, you will see now. And they go towards <laughs> east. And it, but it works, it, it's working, now it's working and we have to deal with something which is a shift. I don't see this coming from the Muslim Brotherhood. I don't, I don't see this coming from the, the, the Nahda. They are very much about our relationship with the West. And I think that this is something which is a lack of creativity in political and economic terms. I, th this is my position, even though uh, uh, they are starting now having a, a new relations with, with China, we'll see how it's going to, to evolve. And uh, uh, there is something that we haven't talked about here which for me is also essential in the discussion, is about the cultural dimension. I think that we have to be very serious about the, the genius of the southern cultures. And my main concern is, is it possible for Egyptians, for Tunisians, for Libyans, for uh, 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 people in Yemen, uh, in Syria, in the Middle East, to come with something which is a cultural vision that is not only uh, reducing democracy in uh, structural terms, but in something which has to do with the sense of belonging, with creativity, advocating languages, cultures, in arts, in entertainment, in movies, in music, it's not there. So when countries have a lack of creativity in cultural terms, you can see that the well-being is not there. Add to this the economic problems and you have the internal crisis we are facing now. And I think that uh, we are facing a world culture, but we are not responding in cultural terms. So this is where the eth ethics could be interesting, but also something which is cultural, which is important. What we have now, exactly the same. You go to Morocco, you go to Egypt, you go to Tunisia, you have clashes between cultures within. And it's once again uh, an identity business. An identity business is undermining the very, you know, the narrative that we 
uh, we are dealing with. And my conclusion, which is referring to the point that you made, I don't know today where are the institutions that are going to promote this, and I completely agree with, so this is why I'm also very cautious. We can't rely on civil society. The informal process, it's, you know, it's good when we are against. It's not possible when we are for something. And I, I think that uh, all the religious institutions that we have, for example, because my, my starting point for me will be to reform the way we deal with Islam and the way that we deal with our interpretation of Islam, all the main institutions in the Muslim majority countries are problematic. Al-Azhar is problematic. It was under the authority of the regime, but now what kind of teaching are we providing? And it's problematic. In the way, are we facing the challenges of our world today? I think that we have to think about this. Uh, so institutionalizing the religious teaching, it's important. Civil society and having institutions where the civil society, <coughs> sorry, the civil society is more active. This is something that we have. So we have to rely on something which it's also important for all of us. To sit down and to criticize dictators and governments and not understanding that the driving force is going to come from institutionalizing what is coming out of the civil society. So in economic, in, in, in ethical terms, for example, what we are trying to do is we, we, we set a center of Islamic legislation and, and, and uh, ethics is just to produce something which is new in our understanding of what kind of applied Islamic ethics we can have in 11 fields, environment, economy, and, and stop talking about, you know, uh, we have an Islamic economy. I don't buy all these things. Because Islamic economy doesn't mean anything for me. I only know Islamic ethics in economy and Christian ethics in economy and ethics in economy. But having a specific economy, which is new, coming from I don't know where, uh, exactly the same when it comes to gender, when it comes to environment, we have to produce this. So there is a great challenge here co coming from the Muslim majority countries. And I completely agree with your point. I don't have the answer to this. I don't see it and, uh, uh, happening. And I'm, I'm quite concerned within the intellectuals that are very there, there is a, a mindset which is to blame the other, to blame the West, to blame the, and not to come to something which is a critical understanding uh, uh, of what we can, we can, we can do. And uh, my last point is being here in the United States of America, it can be, it might be that our experience as Westerners dealing with the crisis of our democracies is going to be also critical. We need to have something which is not only a South-South dialogue, but a North-South dialogue on our status of citizens. How do we deal with our own so uh, uh, civil society? And, and also the Western Muslims, the American Muslims, who are experiencing something which is a true civil society where you can do things and avoid this polarization between secular means anti-religious and, anti and, and religion means against we, our experience could be something which is part of a new discussion. Let us hope that the social networks that we have can promote a new kind of understanding of some of the principles that we are sharing out of our historical experience. And it might be that the Western Muslims could be very critical in shaping a new type of dialogue in this. Thank you. former professional soccer player, uh, you'll understand the concept of overtime. Uh, we've got a little bit later than, than we have uh, planned, but um, given your interest in the topic, I, I hope we could have a, a broad uh, session of Q&A. Uh, we do have to watch the time because there are other meetings that some of us have to attend because the Ramadan schedule is extremely busy. So I suggest of about 15 minutes of doing with Q&A. And if you want to raise your arm, uh, we'll recognize the question. I'll only intervene if you uh, monopolize the conversation or enter into a monologue. So um, I presume there are several questions. So why don't we start to, to my right? Thank you. Uh, you talk about the Arab issue, but the about a year before these Arab things happened, it happened in Iran that the, there were demonstrations after the election and it was suppressed. And they used the same social networks in Iran also and the government somehow tried to control it and they blocked it and all those things. How do you see that the impact on those the Arab revolutions that they or so that the, they were able to somehow uh, 
correct the things that didn't go right in Iran and it happened well in those countries. And again, with the Salafis uh, movement that is in Egypt and Tunisia, would it be that the, in the long term it will happen the same things that happened to Iranian revolution to those countries that the Emirat of the Egypt or the Tunisia or so on happens there? Yes, in, in the book, in fact, I refer to the Iranian experience by saying it's the first one. In fact, the first people who, who used at that scale the, the social networks were the Iranian opposition, with one difference. So <coughs> the way this was repressed and the way the people were tortured, uh, uh, you know, we have to condemn this in, the, in, in a clear way. And the people knew about it. We saw the images. Uh, and it's quite clear that the repression was uh, 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 terrible and unacceptable. There is one difference, and this is why it succeeded in, in Tunisia, in Egypt, and not maybe in Iran, is that still the social network, the way they were working in Iran was very much within the, uh, the students, the elite, and the uh, the, 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 the cities, but you know, the, not the urban, the urban setting much more than the, 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 the people were not very much involved in the, the, the real way. The second, in the same way. The second dimension, which is a bit different, is the current uh, government and Ahmadinejad, if you go to the countryside, if you talk and, and get a sense of who is supporting, he still has in the countryside, more support than anyone, you know, than Mubarak and Ben Ali. So the kind of, you know, uh, support towards the conservative in Iran is not the same as uh, the lack of support of the dictators in Egypt and in, in, uh, in, in Tunisia. So it's a bit different, even though there is a movement, and there was a movement trying to mobilize the people. And the second thing, which is also, the third thing, which is also interesting, is that the people who are the reformists who are against the conservative are still working from within the system. So Musawi is not saying we don't want the Islamic Republic. He want, we, we want a new type of Islamic Republic. We want to come back to the origin of our project. And I think it's more complex than the very bold, clear statement, we don't want the dictator and we stop. So there is something which is a complex situation uh, in Iran where the, the, the reformist trend and, and what is happening now is very much the conservative taking over and very much uh, 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 repressing any kind of uh, opposition. I would say that what could happen in Iran on the long term is something that is going to, 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 to go towards reform anyway. I really think that Iran cannot stay the way it is now. Something is going to change. How? I don't know. And I don't think that we can compare Iran the way it is now with Saudi Arabia. I think these are two different realities. Add to this uh, 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 last factor, which is going to be instrumental in the coming years, is this divide between Sunni and Shia and the relationship between Iran, Syria, Lebanon, and the relationship with Israel. This is also critical as to the internal changes that we can see. Professor, thank you very much for speaking with us. We touched upon the U.S. as well and possibly fomenting the Arab Springs beforehand. I was hoping we could touch upon the U.S.'s role during and after the revolutions in the regions. I think um, the U.S. has a long history of involvement in the region, maybe not very special, maybe not very competent, maybe not very cohesive, but a history of involvement. At the same time, at least during the revolutions in Tunisia and Egypt, the U.S. seems almost strangely uninvolved. We were late to the game in calling for Mubarak's ouster, but we didn't actively say that our policy was that he should remain. Therefore, um, at, at the same time, I think um, on the ground, at least in Egypt, where I've done my research, most of the people there remember that the U.S. was standing by Mubarak and actively fighting against the revolution and feel that the U.S. essentially played their cards very badly. What I was hoping to ask you then would be, how should we look at the U.S.'s foreign policy, you know, reacting to the revolutions, which apparently took us by surprise? Should we say that um, the U.S. acted appropriately? Or should we say that we acted too cautiously? Should we say that we were misguided and missed an important opportunity to 
establish relations with people instead of the dictators of these regions? And what should we see in the future? What can we hope for in, as far as US policy in the Middle East? I will end up being the president here. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know many of the answers to your questions. I can just guess and, and assess. First, I wouldn't go, and I, I, I think I completely agree with you, we, we, we have to be very cautious not to generalize. You said both that, that, that we have to take country per country because it's completely different. Uh, Tunisia is not Egypt, Egypt is completely different. You know, when I was asked at the beginning after what happened in Tunisia, I was very cautious about the future in Egypt, saying, no, it's not going to, be to, to happen in Egypt because Egypt is too critical you know, in geostrategic terms. Uh, I, was very, I, I was not expecting this to happen in that way. Now, I think that if you look at uh, uh, the way they are dealing, uh, or the United States were dealing, in fact, it's not true that they were not involved and very passive. But they were very much the, you know, even in Libya, anyone who is thinking that they, they left, you know, the whole uh, things to be done by the French, you know, because Sarkozy was very much, uh, he was so absent in Tunisia that he had to be present in Libya. Uh, I think that the American intelligence have been, you know, they were there for years before and involved and, 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 and very much so. So I think that uh, in Libya, if you look at the way they dealt with the situation, it's quite interesting because at the end of the day, many of the uh, uh, economic interests are protected still. And there is a deal between them, uh, the, the, the British, the French, and the Qatari forces over there. In Tunisia, once again, I think it's quite interesting because they started talking to another not the year they were elected or just before the election, uh, we have, you know, uh, meetings that started six years ago with people from en So, uh, and even before, so they, they were in touch with the opposition. And it's, it's normal for an, any administration to have this kind of... Uh, so knowing also that there is a very clear evolution, and, and you said something which is important. Now we are uh, listening to Islamists and say, oh, they are changing their <laughs> wording, they are changing the way they think, or are they only changing the way they speak? Uh, because, you know, uh, they, they all speak about democracy now and they speak about civil society and even Rashid Rannouchi went as far as to say we don't want Sharia in constitution. We're not going to put Sharia. Uh, uh, so they are evolving. I would say we have to wait and see what they are going to do on the ground because, uh, you know, many of the people that I know today who are socio-democrats, yesterday were Trotskyists. So you cannot just, you know, mistrust all the people by saying, because you evolve, you are cheating. <coughs> no, evolving in your way you look at politics could be something which is happening, and, and maybe they really uh, are really evolving. I really think, for example, that Erdogan evolved a great deal over the last 20 years. He evolved cre clearly in his way of looking at the Islamic reference, and he was uh, in disagreement with Erbakan, who was his mentor. So people are evolving. <laughs> and not only this, within the Muslim Brotherhood and in Nahda, you have also people, the new generation. So now when it comes to the United States, they are studying this. And, and I think that in Tunisia, they are doing something which is quite interesting by following uh, 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 the movement. In Egypt, you, 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 you seem to think that they were passive. That's not true as well. They were very much involved with the army and, and trying to understand who is going to win within the army. And they still are. The army is the main uh, uh, actor and uh, uh, <laughs> partnership, uh, partner uh, for, for, for the Americans in the region. So what is going to happen if you look at, you know, anything could happen that can be very, very destructive and have very heavy consequences. Just what happened yesterday could, could have consequences depending how uh, uh, the people are going to react to this. So um, I cannot have a, a, a comprehensive picture. I would take country per country. I don't think that what is done and not done in Syria is good. I think that uh, uh, I, I really have a problem with the way they are dealing with uh, Iraqi situation, the Afghani situation, and the Syrian situation. Even the Yemen, uh, the, the <coughs> in Yemen, it's, it's problematic. Uh, but I, I would add one thing, which I would expect from the American administration, something that uh, is beyond any hope, which is just to be consistent with, with, with its own principles, and not only to look after its interests. So we may dream.
Let's take one more question. I know there's a lot more to be said, but uh, we're pushing time, as I said, and we do have to do <coughs> so. Why don't you take the last question, please? Okay. Thank sure. you. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, I know we've been talking about it too much, and I'm not yet familiar with your manuscript, so this might be a shot into uh, space, but still. I was trying to understand your position on uh, the value or what was referred to the genius of the sub ethics. Um, of the need, so you talk about the need to produce something positive, something substantial, something creative, an own alternative um, suite. Um, and then you speak on the one hand side of the valuable source that this Islamic ethic is, and then on the other hand, you describe the struggle for the definition of the um, so the struggle of the, the claim, they try to claim Islamic ethics for their own, and the authority that this Islamic ethics gives uh, the political actors. So I wonder how you can reconcile these two positions. How can something be a priori valuable that is constantly renegotiated through the struggle on the ground of what it actually is? Yes, that, that's a very good question. Uh, and I think that if you, you try to study what is happening now in the Muslim majority countries and even within the Muslim communities in the West, I would say something that I'm not <coughs> scared and I have no hesitation of, of saying, that the great majority of the Muslims today are reformists and uh, 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 promoting the values that we, are, we were talking about. I think that the people who are in the streets, taking into the streets in Egypt, in Tunisia, they were really about freedom, justice, dignity. And this is something which, for them, they were not less Muslims because they, are, they were advocating these principles. And I think that this is where the struggle is. We have minority groups who have political agenda and religious understanding. At the same time, they can have a religious understanding, which is sincerely there. And uh, you have also political uh, agenda. This is an internal struggle which is very important, is how do we not only base your uh, understanding of Islam on the fact that the great majority are happy with freedom and dignity. This is why I really think that the questions that I had here are very important. This has to be institutionalized, this has to be thought, and this is a vision that should come from within the Islamic majority countries, which is based on the principles that can come out of this reference. And out of this reference, it doesn't mean that we are not going to, 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 to struggle. I am struggling with people who think that I'm no longer a Muslim because I, must, I, I am too much open or too much westernized. It's a struggle. But you can't avoid this discussion in Muslim majority countries. Why you can't avoid it? Because after the uprising, it's quite clear. Islam is going to play a role in the future of this society. I'm just coming back from Malaysia. And I was talking to Muslims there, and even with people who are very close to being secular, but still they understand there is no future in Malaysia if you don't refer to Islam. So we have now a discussion about can we use Allah for the Christian, yes and no? What is the meaning of Sharia? So what you said as question, which is critical, we need to have something which is a very clear, uh, uh, critical discussion on the terminology, the concepts, and the principles. We have to do this. And what I'm saying, it's for the first time in our history, our Western experience is helping us to get to that. Which is, you know, for years, the answers were coming from the, the, the perception that the center was, you know, uh, feeding us with answers at the periphery being in America. Now our experience, what we think about some of the values, what we see with the young generation of people in the streets, asking about you know, dignity, women's rights, uh, human rights, uh, freedom. It's coming. This is something that, and they are not saying we want to be less Muslim, to be more open. This is where we need to come with a critical discussion. So it's, it's a contradiction as to the political tensions that we have and different interpretations. But at the end, we need to have something which is promoting these values, discussing them. And I think that one of the angles through which we can uh, discuss this is the ethical angle, is what are the objectives and what are the principles that we are promoting beyond the uh, 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 black and white understanding. But I'm also concerned by the fact that Western governments are often dealing with governments that are promoting a very narrow understanding of Islam in order to protect their interests. 
And I think that this is also something which is important for us. If we are serious and consistent, you can't hope for the Muslims to open up and at the same time, for the sake of your interest, you support the more, uh, not only conservative, but narrow-minded and very, very reactionary uh, understanding of Islam. And this is what we, the price that we are paying now in the way we deal with this. So, so it's a, an internal struggle, and it's an important one, and the answers are not only going to come from the Muslim majority countries. It's, it's a global way of dealing with the issue. Unfortunately, out of time. Let me once again refer back to a book uh, that's uh, at the back of the room by Professor Ramadan, who's available to sign some of these books. It is unfortunately not the latest book we've put out. Uh, as I said, uh, productivity has outpaced the, uh, the publishing market at this point. But uh, it'll be available at the, at the University of Purchase book. Please join me in thanking Professor Ramadan for his